don't get caught up in HR processes. Try and understand what the business problem is and focus on helping the business with that issue. I think we get drowned in HR processes and forget our role is really to support the business and improve, help the business, improve the business rather than roll out processes. Welcome to the HR L&D podcast with your host, Nick Day. Tune in to discover what it takes to truly develop within human resources as we delve deep into growth, engagement, and leadership strategies that can unlock the hidden potential within your business, which we hope will really empower your workforce towards fantastic organizational success. So I'm really excited to bring you, my HR L&D podcast listeners, a fantastic and really exciting podcast episode as I got an opportunity to sit down with Devyani Veyashampayan. Now, she's the managing partner of the HR Tech Partnership. They're a people tech investment company, uh, and they are really focused on people tech, working on HR digital tech that's been hitting the market and really disrupting the HR marketplace. The technology is very much focused on employee and digital talent technology, and they also run the Human Capital Digital Innovation Hub, which is there to help corporates and HR teams learn and experiment around the future of work. To give you some context to Deviani's experience, she has been an international and multi-sector group CHRO and board member for some of the largest heavyweight companies you'll ever know. Companies including Citibank, AT&T, British Gas, Rolls-Royce. She's lived and worked in China, Singapore and Europe. Deviani is considered a thought leader around the future of work. She is a practical HR professional who's able to blend her expertise as a practitioner within HR along with her unique perspective when it comes to digital innovation and investment. So it's a really exciting episode. And if you're interested in digital HR disruptive technologies, then you go and want to tune in to find out more. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Cheers. Hello, Devyani. Really good to have you on the Human Resources and Learning and Development podcast with me today. Thanks, Nick. And uh, it's great to be on your show. I have listened to your earlier podcasts, and I think it's it's really, really interesting, the range of topics you cover. Um, a little about myself. I think uh, for most of my career, I have been uh, an HR professional uh, and worked as a senior HR director for uh, particularly for large international businesses but across a range of different industries. So I started with Pricewaterhouse and Consulting. I was then with Citibank um, on the banking side, then with AT&T uh, or Lucent Technologies on, in telecoms, where I was the EMEA HR director. Uh, then moved on to British, the BG Group of British Gas, where I was the Asia Pacific and Middle East uh, HRD took on my first group HR director role with a company called American Eagle Tankers, which is a shipping business, a global shipping business. Then was with Rolls-Royce um, as their global HR director for the marine services business. Um, and my last role was with BSI, the British Standards Institute, as the group HR director. So, uh, yes, I have spent a fair amount of time in HR. In fact, I was feeling quite old listening to myself right now. But uh, as, as I said, a, a, a huge range, a huge variety. Uh, and I therefore, one thing I really feel, feel I understand best is uh, the stress, stresses and strains that an HR function faces and HR professionals have to go through to keep pace with, um, I guess, the changing uh, demands of the business. Uh, but what drove me to do what I'm doing right now? And, and let me first briefly explain what I do. Um, I do two things. Um, I run an angel investment fund where my investors are all senior HR directors and we invest in artificial intelligence or digital tech-based HR startups. And the whole logic is HR is the space we understand, but clearly startups today really have a lot of innovative solutions and therefore trying to marry the two. Um, and the second thing that, that my firm does is we run a human capital digital innovation hub, which is a six month program for corporates or HR teams who nowadays are 
uh, you know, hear a lot of talk, a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, but are not quite sure whether how much of that is hype, what is real. Uh, and this is a great way for them to experiment, uh, to test the waters, to come up close with some of these solutions and understand how they're really different from technology and automation that they've been used to. So I guess there's, there's really three areas that I dabble in and they all intersect. Uh, the first is clearly the world of HR, uh, which, which I'm very familiar with. The second is the world of digital, uh, because my focus is really uh, AI and digital solutions in startups particularly. Um, and invariably, they all have a very innovative solution. And it's also therefore about exposing HR professionals to, to digital innovation. Sure, sure. Well, the, the good thing to know for all our listeners is we're in really esteemed HR company, which is fantastic. I think your your track record precedes you, which is which is amazing. And something that you know, immediately comes to mind at the moment when we talk about HR technology, and you know some of the buzzwords out there at the moment, are things like you know automation in particular, and how you know the new digital technologies are really going to influence the future of, of human resources. And as a recruiter, obviously I specialize in human resources recruitment, so I have these conversations quite regularly. One of the most pertinent questions that I'm asked or that HR professionals are potentially concerned about when we, relation, when we relate it to tech is in the future, is a robot going to steal my job? So what do you feel about the, 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 the nature of HR in terms of robotics at the moment? And is that something people should be concerned about? Um, so I guess um, the, not a single day goes by without hearing some news about job losses and uh, automation or robots, uh, whether it's in factories, whether it's driverless cars on the road, which again means humans won't be needed, uh, whether it is Ocado having its first fully uh, robot, you know, uh, automated warehouse with not a single human being in it. So I think there's no, and, and also with taxis now, uh, with flying taxis, again, which will not have human beings. Uh, so I think there is absolutely no doubt that Artificial intelligence and machine learning is having a big impact on jobs, on tasks, um, and, on, and and therefore on, on human beings. Uh, I guess the question, however, is how fast is this going to happen? Um, and, and, and there it's really difficult because, for example, in 2017, which is really two years ago, McKinsey came out with a fairly detailed re report where they said that by 2030, 50% of all human jobs would get automated. So I think at that time, the estimate really was uh, in 13 years time, uh, they, it would see a significant proportion as 50% of human beings would get replaced by machines. Barely a year later, which is in 2018, the World Economic Forum came out with another revised forecast. So they said, actually, it's not 50%, it's 52%. But more importantly, they said this would happen by 2025, not 2030. Now, what it means is what was expected to happen in 13 years was reduced to seven years, to a time frame of seven years by the World Economic Forum. And this was last year. So I think the speed of change, so there's absolutely no doubt that machines will be replacing humans in a far bigger way. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the proportion of that is going to be far bigger than what's happened in the past. I guess the question, however, is when is this going to happen? Uh, is it going to happen in the next five years, in the next seven years, or the next 10 years? Uh, but I think for anyone who's in HR, I don't think there's any doubt that if this is going to happen. It's happening fairly fast. And actually, revi uh, revisions of forecasts indicate it's going to happen much sooner than, than anyone thinks. So that's, that's one side of it. So I guess in terms of job loss, it is going to be absolutely uh, real and something that needs to be planned for. But on the other side, I think equally there's going to be a sh severe shortage of talent <laughs> because there's a, a, we are entering what we call as a new digital economy. And it's no longer a case that digital skills will be needed in the IT function. I think digital skills will impact every kind of job. 
So let's say today if you are a compliance officer in a bank or if you are an operations manager on an assembly line or even if, if you're just a technical writer, um, all those three jobs could disappear because of um, automation. But equally, the same, uh, some of the same uh, roles, uh, aspects of the role could be needed to be done, but with a strong knowledge of digital. So I think, uh, in fact, there is an estimate that um, the knowledge of machine learning, robotics, Internet of Things, or what we call as high-tech skills, the gap in Europe is going to be more than 500,000 by 2020. Now, 2020 is, is again, uh, barely uh, 10 years, 11 years away. So I think you, there's two very interesting phenomena. You, you are going to see a whole lot of robots taking over a whole lot of jobs. And when I say robots, I mean it very loosely. I'm really talking about machine, machine learning. But on the other hand, there will be a whole lot of new jobs and new skills needed, which could provide opportunities for people who are prepared for it. Sure. I think that's a really important distinction to make. I guess the, the big question, the big if, is whether or not there are the same number of new jobs created as there will be numbers lost. Because obviously, if there isn't, then there's going to be, unfortunately, a workforce that um, is going to struggle to find work if that's the case. So, they, you know, as you say, planning for it now is, is, is critical. But also, I think there's a, a little piece which I think that McKinsey study, which I've, I've looked at as well, and I've done some podcasts on that in the past in relation to my payroll podcast, is I think it's a little bit generic. And obviously, you're an expert, so you'll know more about this than, than I do. But I think ultimately, a, a lot of the the roles, it's going to be tasks within jobs that are automated as well, rather than the whole job itself. So as if I take payroll as an example, of course, many labor-intensive parts to a payroll position in terms of data entry, where you know a robot or intelligent AI could easily automate that task to save time but that doesn't necessarily mean that payable professional is no longer needed it just means that we can focus their attentions on potentially more strategic tasks or the tasks that actually still require human input and um, i think i think that's where people are concerned there's been these studies that kind of say that sweeping change is going to come which it will but sweeping change in terms of jobs completely disappearing but actually there's going to be new jobs created which you mentioned and also existing jobs will evolve to become something else. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting made redundant. It just means that the, the task that you're currently doing may change significantly. Would you agree with that or would I be off the mark? No, no, and, and I think you're completely on the mark there. I think, you know, it, firstly, this is not new. You know, we've had technology around, we've had automation for quite some time. I mean, if you look at recruitment, anyone who works in recruitment has been used to uh, a, the, you know, the automation that has been happening uh, continuously, uh, and B, also the level of outsourcing that's been happening, whether it's an RPO model, whether it's, it's, it's something else, whether it's agencies. So I think this whole thing of your job can stay the same is, is not new. Uh, and HR professionals have been dealing with this for quite some time. But again, if you look at the recruitment scenario, uh, what has happened is, for someone who probably was focused more on the uh, manual aspect or data, just the data sorting aspect of the job, would find themselves without a job. Those that have understood that actually the interface with the business, the, the candidate experience or interfacing with a candidate, the application of your of your creativity uh, is is all those aspects. The, the the you know what do you call as more is soft skills, the human skills, the analytical skills. I think if they, if that was, if they focused on developing that, recruiters are still, good recruiters are still very much in demand and needed. So it's not as if people won't be needed, but you do need to adapt to a different skill set. Something slightly different, however, in the AI and machine learning aspect is automation in the past, or still continues to focus on uh, speed efficiency of current process um, and also focuses more on what has happened. Where I think AI and machine learning is slightly different is there is an intelligent application which automation doesn't really compete with. And so things that currently human beings use technology for but then still have to think through Machine learning and AI is capable of that thinking through. So there is a higher element of skills uh, that can be done by machines because of machine learning. 
And that's the aspect also that everyone needs to be very aware of. And, and I'm going back again to, let's say, a compliance officer in a role in a bank. Through automation, probably the whole, you know, the document management, uh, sorting, and, and, and you know, those kind of record keeping, probably those aspects would have been done by technology. But today, I guess even the aspects of doing a first, first search through the document, figuring it out if there are areas of which pose are, which are of risk, you know, even that first level screening, which is more an intelligent application, can, could be done by a machine, which is a slightly different scenario. Sure. I think you raised some really interesting points. I think for me, there are, there are two two sides to this. You mentioned recruitment, so something that I know an awful lot about. I've managed my own recruitment firm now for, for 11 years here at JGA Recruitment. And you know we've trialed and, and used aspects of automated technology to try and improve the efficiency of what we do. And I think it's, it's about getting the right balance. There are some recruiters, though, and I think there's been a shift in the recruitment market, so where they almost overused automation to the point where they're relying on a volume game and everyone who's probably listening to this who's LinkedIn or similar will know when you've received an automated email from a recruiter or whether it's a genuine, they've looked at my profile and really taken the time to, to assess me. And actually, the, the, the problem with that from a recruitment perspective is it, it, it switches people off. So if I now was to write an individual email for someone who's perfect for something, um, they may not look at it because they're so used to the automated ones that have been coming before. So that, that that's a, a negative side of it. Yes, you have the volume, but no, you lose that personal touch. And actually something we're trying to do at JJ Recruitment here is let's bring back the human element. So in our particular industry, our product is people. So it's so important that we don't lose sight of what it is as a recruiter that we're really working and involved in. And you can't, it's very difficult to replace the one-to-one intuitive conversation that takes place between people and it's also very easy to try and replace it with what i would call lazy recruitment techniques which is email everyone as you possibly can automate the responses see what comes back um so there are two sides to it it can help on one side but eventually if you do too much of it it can frustrate and put people off but i think on the second side of things that you mentioned there the the, uh, the most exciting and the most nerve-wracking part of all this is Seeing how much technology, both in the recruitment, HR and payroll spaces, seeing how much it's advanced just in the last 12 to 24 months makes you think, well, if these studies are relating to the next, you know, 13 years or seven years, it's we don't know what's to come yet. Right? You may have a, a better insight. And I'll be really interested to know what you're seeing that perhaps isn't even into the market yet. But the reality is there is so much out there that we can't even comprehend that's going to be developed so in, in a relatively short space of time. So. It's quite exciting to think what technology might be available in five years, if you think about the rate that we're advancing at. Um, What's your view? Is there anything out there that you're seeing that could really disrupt the HR HR space uh, in terms of perhaps technology we're not seeing yet, but that could come into play? Yeah, so firstly, I think our scope uh, really, both for the fund as as well as the hub, is any part of the employee life cycle. So... um, I guess recruitment tends to be a more a people kind of obvious one because you know the recruitment function has always used technology. It also involves uh, a, a big emphasis on speed, on costs. Uh, the business is very involved, so uh, it's no surprise that uh, the recruitment function has seen a lot more disruption as compared to the other parts of the employee life cycle. Uh, in fact, last year alone, there were more than three thousand. Um, tech startups in the recruitment space, um, and, and 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 again, going back to the example you've given, I guess uh, what a lot of them are trying to do is not just look at bringing more efficiency to the current process, but helping employers dip into very different talent pools. For example, I know of a great solution that. Uh, you know, is able to match. Uh, so from an in, in, in large organizations, internal job postings happen. But I think what this does is it helps the an employee build up their own profile. And then that will automatically source internal jobs as and when they come up. But you could also then link it to your own internal and external network, LinkedIn network. So you could have people from your external network also get access to some of these roles. Uh, alumni who have left the organization are also able to participate in this. And that then means as an employer, you are able to, in a in a more intelligent, sophisticated way, 
access these talent pools, which clearly would have required a lot more effort earlier. So recruitment is is really a, a bit of a no brainer. But what's interesting is there's this this lots more happening in all other parts of the employee life cycle. So workforce planning is beginning to see some really again intelligent ways of matching. Uh, external, internal talent pools. Um, employee engagement is a huge area right now, and we've moved past the, uh, of course, the, uh, you know, what used to happen uh, five or 10 years earlier, which is a sur- youth survey every two years, to now having more intuitive app-based surveys. But actually, newer technologies, whether it's facial recognition, whether it's speech recognition, that's also it's they're making inroads into uh, helping culture, employee engagement, uh, or or just assessment in terms of recruitment. I'm I'm seeing you know their application in all three areas. Uh, talent management again is is a very interesting space. Uh, talent management, which also includes coaching, career development. Again, traditionally it was a very top down approach, uh, and because of budgets, because it meant invest a lot of investments. It's only uh, selected uh, talent pools, whether they were high potentials or senior management, who got invested into it. But today, there is a lot more of virtual online team coaching, one-on-one coaching, AI-based coaching. And I think that's a, that's a great development because it really helps employees take more charge of their own development and career growth. But equally, I mean, you know, wellness is another big area. And, and, and it's, a, again, a lot of this is, I don't think people have even thought of the possibilities. So our latest investment, for example, it's in, in the area of musculoskeletal pain, I mean, which is really neck and back pain. Now, the reality is one in two employees suffer from neck and back pain. Um, and of course, organizations, and particularly, I think, not just those who have a blue collar population, I think even office based, uh, there is a loss of productivity, costs because people go off work, the return to work often is, is delayed, et cetera. And uh, Track Active, which is our latest investment, it's a chatbot assisted AI based platform which helps employees either take preventative action or even if they were referred to physiotherapists, it helps them you know, through a series of nudges, feedback, uh, personalized exercises, et cetera, it helps then uh, their their rehabilitation in in a far quicker way. Now, who would have thought an area like neck and back pain would have a chatbot-assisted AI-based platform? But that's the kind of innovation I think you're seeing in the HR space right now. I think that's a fantastic example. And actually, I think it's really important. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the second part of the podcast about exactly what your investment fund does and, and how it's going to help the, the, the human capital and, and, and digital space in the future. But I think it's really important to mention that as, as it's very we can be fearful of technology, but we can't change the fact that it's coming. So it's important that we do plan for it. It's important that we do embrace it with, with a positive mindset because... As you say, there are so many different new and innovative solutions being being brought to market that can really help our workforce, can really benefit the, the, the place that we work in, in both our, and our home lives as well. So, you know, if we if we have that positive mindset to embrace it, I think that's when you're in the right space to really be able to utilize it and and take advantage of the new the new innovations that are coming to market. But the last question, um, if I may, Devyani, before we find out a little bit more about you, that is, you mentioned recruitment as being obviously a very obvious market, which you know technology is 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 trying to innovate at the moment and, and I'm seeing a lot of the, the solutions being pitched to me as, as a recruitment owner. Should I personally be worried about the state of the external recruitment industry and what should I and or human resources professionals really be doing right now to prepare for the change that's coming? So I guess let me first highlight three or four different ways in which um, you know, machines and, and, and AI is impacting uh, the workforce or, or the HR functions or what HR professionals do. Um, one is, I think, substitution. So, you, you know, you, that's really machines replacing workers. For so example, packing machines in warehouses. Now, I think from a recruitment perspective or as a recruiter, if you don't understand the scale and scope of how that is happening, it's not going to help you really be a good business partner to your business and help them in an understanding and planning for things that are coming up. So that's at at the very lowest level. 
I guess the second is is big area where I see the impact of AI and machine learning and recruitment is what I call as augmentation, where technology is really expanding the capability of recruiters. So, you know, you have chatbots now which help uh, any, any candidate questions. You have uh, AI software that's used in call centers where, again, it helps a recruiter you know, respond uh, to, to to candidate queries or or or, or the whole process of of uh, you know shortlisting. I guess in the assessment area itself, technology is being used in a variety of ways. And I, I've, I've previously referred to facial recognition. I've referred to uh, you know uh, the latest one. I was in Tel Aviv last week, and as you know, Israel is one of the top five countries in the world for AI and tech. I think what they are, they come up with is really quite uh, top of, you know, top class and, and therefore they are quite ahead as compared to most countries in the world. And I saw assessment solutions, as I said, uh, looking at uh, digital, uh, because today we live in a digital world and doing it in a very sophisticated manner, which helps employers screen employees uh, or also, as I said, sound. So those are, are, are clearly areas to look out for. Blockchain is another technology that I think recruiters should start getting familiar with because whether it's for referencing, some great referencing solutions using blockchain um, or even um, you know other aspects. So blockchain as a technology is something to keep track of. And the other one is virtual reality. Again, uh, virtual reality is being used for onboarding uh, in quite a significant way. And all these things are really great because they improve the candidate experience. It helps the recruiter's job in getting candidates on board. Um, so I think what I call as uh, augmentation is a big, big part of how AI is being used uh, in, the in the recruitment space. The When you talk of disruption, I think the bit that probably particularly uh, you know, recruitment firms have to keep in mind is what I call as disintermediation. Uh, what is that? I mean, very simply, it's really how a uh, delivery operates, for example. What they've done is they've really connected the consumer with the main restaurant and, and they've brought the two together in a very different way, in, in a, which improves, I guess, speed, efficiency, et cetera. And what I'm seeing now is some really good solutions um, which are really marketplaces and which are removing the middlemen, which are removing the recruitment agencies. And often they cater to very specific uh, profiles. Uh, and it's no surprise that a lot of them are based around digital skills or, or catering to digital workers. But I've also seen, I mean, the gig economy is going to be a big trend. So I've seen some great platforms that cater only to professionals who want flexible working. And that does not mean women. In the past, it really meant catering to women. This this is a truly, um, you know, for all white collar workers, but it also deals with integration issues very well. So they look at payment, they look at onboarding, and they look at all that, which means as an employer. And and, and if, again, and that's my biggest, uh, you know, kind of focus when I look at a solution. If I were to look at a solution uh, or a platform like that, I don't want to spend a lot of time integrating it with whatever else I have. So I think uh, this, you know, the, the kind of delayering or cutting away the middlemen, as I call it, is, is a big trend and which as a recruitment, I think any recruitment agency needs to be fully aware of so that they, uh, as you said earlier, there's a lot more value you can add by the actual human uh, interface, either with the client or with the candidate. But clearly, these platforms are going to change the way uh, recruitment gets done. Um, and and I guess the last aspect, uh, the second, the, the second last aspect is collaboration. So we've seen Slack being used or collaboration tools being used in house. But again, I think the use of that within candidate community, creating a community, is another uh, example. The biggest space, of course, where I'm seeing the impact of AI and machine learning is still uh, the operational and the employee experience. And we've referred to that. But again, one of our Investi companies is a company called Recruitment Smart. Um, and what they do is CV screening using AI, um, and they can screen up to a billion CVs per day. Now, again, CV screening using technology is not new. But I think what is distinctive with AI and machine learning is 
is there is a far more intelligent application, which means the confidence to use automated tools then jumps up as compared to, uh, as you pointed out, uh, if it's just simply uh, at a basic level, as a candidate, you can figure out very quickly that this really doesn't take into account my own individual background and considerations. Yeah, I think that's that's a brilliant answer, a very well-rounded answer that covered kind of all the points uh, that take some of my questions off the table, which is fantastic, Deviani, so thank you. And I think a great example at the end there that um, you know we've definitely used uh, different tools in the past for CV screening. For ourselves, we find that because we're in a very niche market, nothing quite beats our own expertise. So we've actually never continued with those. We may have trialed them in the past. They've never worked for us as a recruitment agency. I think though they can definitely work in more generalist realms where you've got high volumes, um, you know, you're dealing with with multiple roles, low level, where the screening doesn't have to be quite as in-depth or as specialized. And maybe maybe AI and intelligent uh, technology solutions will improve the systems, but certainly the ones that we've looked at as an external agency, they haven't quite worked for us because of the niche nature of the markets we're in. But I'm definitely interested to see you know what's to come, and I'm I'm someone that tries to embrace and and test all the different types of technology that are hitting the market because you just never know how something might be able to benefit the benefit you in the longer term. So, uh, well, a brilliant answer. Thank you so much. So we're going to find out a lot more about uh, the investment fund just after a quick advert break, and we're going to find out a little bit more about you as well. Time to find out more about you. So question one, Deviani, with all of you, the things you have going on around you at the moment, you're clearly very busy. So how do you get to relax in your downtime? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I guess one of the nice things about doing what I do right now is it allows me to do things that I missed in a busy corporate career, which was to read much more, to be curious and find out about things much more. And that in itself can be quite relaxing because it's something that excites me. So I think uh, there's, there's that. But otherwise, uh, I am a great reader of fiction. Uh, I love that. You know, at the moment the book list is announced, I'm off running and trying to get all the books and, and kind of read them. So re- reading is something I enjoy very much. And I'm also lucky to live in an area in London that has got woods around, greenery around. So walking is another way for me to de-stress. Ah, fantastic. Fantastic. So who are the two people that have been the most influential to you in your career? Uh, I guess there's different uh, definitions of influential. Um, But I think uh, I would really say... uh, my first boss at Citibank, I mean, Citibank was a great organization. I still regard it as one of the best places in terms of very high caliber of people, great set of leaders, an environment. But truly, I mean, and, you know, nowadays, people, organizations put in programs to really have innovation, to have engagement. All that just seemed to happen there. And I think it was because there was a lot of trust. But also they, there was a, so much of change in the environment that when you have very smart people and you just let them get on with things. Um, and I had a great boss and I, and I spent six years there and I, I, a lot of what I learned uh, was was through him. Uh, and, and so, my, as I said, Pradeep was my boss at Citibank and I still think uh, he influenced a lot of my uh, professionalism as an HR person, but also, uh, you know, who I am today. I think the other one would be my husband. Uh, uh, I, again, I think he has been completely supportive of what I've done. But I think also he has allowed me or given me the space. Uh, And I say that because I come from an environment when I, you know, I grew up in India. I I, I live with my in-laws there. And as a woman at that time, while it was expected that I would be educated. Uh, I think it was not expected that I would be a career professional. So um, again, my mother-in-law was a doctor, but then she her focus was more the home. And so I think right from the beginning, I've always traveled a lot, worked a lot, put in long hours, um, and of course have, have had a family subsequently. But none of this, none of my career success today would have happened if I didn't have strong support from my spouse. Ah, fantastic. And it's, it's a great that you've got an opportunity here to uh, to, to mention it. So it, it's, it's great to hear. It's great to hear you've got such a good support uh, network around you. So a little bit of fun here. If you could be given any superpower, what would it be and why? Uh, to figure out what people are actually thinking. Oh, yeah, nice. 
Perfect. It will be useful in your space as well, right? Uh, and last question. If you could invite three people to a dinner party, who would it be and why? This is going to need some thinking. Um, so I think, um, you know, Ellie Shafak is one of my favorite authors. I would love to invite her. Um, I'm forgetting the Tesla guy's name. Gosh. Um, Musk, Elon Musk. I would love to have Elon Musk because I do think uh, he's both. He's crazy, but he's also visionary. Um, and more importantly, he's had so much courage to 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 actually build up things and stick with things which would have which which would have seemed completely impossible. So Elon Musk, Ellie Shafak, um, and I guess just the third is is Helmut Schuster, who's the group HRD of BP. Uh, he's an investor in my fund, but he's been great. I think you know all my investors have been great. When I set up the fund, I really had had no investment background, and yet the fact that they've put in personal money. And it was a completely new concept and backed me just because they felt I was capable of doing it. They had the confidence. And Helmut is a great example of that. And he continues to be a big supporter. So, yeah. Have you ever asked yourself, how can any recruiter understand my HR recruitment challenges? Please don't give up on your hiring challenges just yet. Here at JGA HR Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top human resources talent. We also understand just how costly a poor hire can be. JGA HR Recruitment would like to partner with you to help you overcome your hiring challenges. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. The l and Podcast, final questions to help listeners engage, learn and perform. Tell the listeners a little bit about what your investment fund does, Vastaviani. So um, uh, again, for those who are not familiar with an investment fund, uh, what, it, what it means simply is, uh, you know, you put in money in a fund and usually the fund is focused on either some specific areas or there are funds that are quite generic. Now. Uh, in the, in my case, all my investors are, as I said, senior corporate directors. Actually, they're all FTSE 100 Group HRDs. So if I were to give some name, or they're non-exec directors who earlier were FTSE 100 Group HR directors. So some examples of my investors are um, there's Paul Rabbi, who's the uh, Group HRD of Alphabeti, Jill Shedden, who's the Group HRD of Centrica, I uh, have Rob Luchin, who's the group HRD of GKN, Helmet, who's the group HRD of BP. Or I have folks like Celia Baxter, who was early the group HRD for Bunzel, and she's now a non-exec director on several FTSE boards. Or Martin Sorkins, who is the group HRD of Rentacle, and again, he's a non-exec director. So um, I guess uh, the fund was really aimed at saying, okay, this is a space we understand, so so our risk definitely goes down rather than tech, which is still a new thing, um, and doing it in things like maybe medical or fintech, which we really don't know much about. At least it's an area we understand. But it was also born out of the conviction that AI and tech is going to disrupt things. It's not business as usual. It's not just technology. It's actually going to disrupt things. And if you can figure out some of the winning uh, solutions or startups or products and back them, then there's an exciting opportunity to see to 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 feel as if you know you have contributed to obviously to make money. There's no doubt this is a financial venture. It's not a it's not a not for profit or anything. So it is about ensuring you back the right horse to make money. Um, but it is also for my investors. It's been a great way for them to learn. So a strong driver for them has been to say that. We are doing senior roles. We need to understand this better. Uh, organization still moves slowly, but if I'm sitting at, at at the board table or at the group exec level, and if I need to or influence the business leadership team about how the workforce is going to be di- workplace is going to be disrupted because of digital, and what are the things we need to do differently, I need to get more close and upfront with some of these solutions. Uh, and if I do it with a peer group. 
that I know. Uh, when I say no, it's not as if people know each other personally, but obviously respect each other. It's also fun to do that. And I think those were some of the reasons why uh, this is, has, has grown as well as the fund has grown as well as it does. And the focus of the fund is uh, investment, as I said, in any part of the employee life cycle, right from talent acquisition, learning and development, coaching, employee engagement, wellness, pay and benefit, culture, leadership capability, risk and compliance. It could be in any in any of these areas. But I think our we are very clear about what kind of solutions we want to focus on or invest in. And they have to be aimed at large corporates. So we don't look at solutions catering to SMEs or startups just because we don't understand that space that well. Um, it has to address a real life problem. So this is not about getting excited about blockchain and just investing because it's a blockchain product. At the end of the day, it has to address a real life problem. Um, and I guess to some extent, we, the adoption rate should be reasonable. Uh, there are some solutions which are way beyond their time. There are others which probably there's a lot more of. So I think that's a judgment call that usually I make in the first instance as the managing partner. So I'm constantly looking at the market. I'm constantly looking at startups. Uh, but clearly, I need to see. I meet actually a couple of hundred before I come across one which from an investment perspective feels like the right one. And a big part of the decision is obviously the founder team. Uh, you know, it's really important in, in, in a startup environment. The founders are the key. Um, and apart from all the other things that we look for, which is really commitment, passion, uh, understanding, we look for people who have had some experience in the space. Um, there's no point. Uh, I'm not saying there's no point, but I guess if a 20 year old fresh, fresh from college is trying to design a solution for HR in large corporates, I would be a little more hesitant because they don't understand what the reality is. But if you have have someone who's had some kind of work experience, whether it's as a contractor, whether it's as a, a consultant, whether it's as an employee, then I think there's a more realistic view about how organizations behave and how, in reality, how difficult it is to make a sale. So those are some of the criteria that we look at. But the reason I think I, uh, what it does, and, and I, again, I feel really strongly about this is I think by getting involved in a venture like this, HR professionals, I think there's three strong advantages. Clearly, the first is you do understand AI and digital, and I think that's fine. But the bigger one is you really learn to get far more commercial because it's really getting down to the nitty gritties. And again, you know, I've worked in organizations and I've been in business meetings where you talk about the business plan and you talk, you talk about expansion into new markets, but that's at a different level. And then you have the whole team, whereas here, you're really talking about specifics. You're talking about what's been the financials to date, uh, what do what the projections look like? What is the competition like? What do you think the adoption rate is going to be? Um, so I think a, a really a holistic, rounded view of commercials is what you get. And therefore, improving your financial acumen is, is what you get if you start uh, you know, getting involved in, in an investment. And of course, as I said, doing it in the HR area reduces your risk because you clearly understand more of it than others. So uh, I guess that's been the rationale for the fund. Uh, it, it sounds really exciting. Maybe it's the entrepreneur in me, but I, I'm listening to you with uh, with really inquisitive ears because I just think the whole the whole ethos, the reasons doing it, you know, what you get out of it as a peer group, I I totally understand. I think it makes absolute total sense to me as to why you've got senior human resources directors and, and, and senior decision makers involved in this, because I can absolutely see how if you're at the forefront of what's being pitched from a technology perspective and what's being developed and the reasons behind that, it's absolutely going to advance who you are as an HR professional at the senior end, and and you you know gives you the foresight to know what's coming, um, and it just sounds really exciting. So so kudos for for setting it up, and and it's amazing that to to see that you are where you are, and and it's having the success that it is. And obviously, you have a human capital digital innovation hub. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? And is that something that someone might be listening to this now can they get involved in that? 
Yeah, so I think, you know, because of the fund, clearly uh, what I was doing is meeting a, a lot of really great startups and looking at the innovation that's happening. Um, but and, and, and I was also getting approached because of my background by senior HR leaders to say, gosh, can you tell us what's actually happening? Uh, and we really know we need to understand this more. Or you had a senior, you know, like my investors, for example, they they personally get it. But very often you have a senior HR leader who whose team is still very much down, you know, the kind of heads down, just focused on the transactional things. And it's and and and, and, and it's difficult for that HR leader to get the message across that this is changing and 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 and, and all of us need to understand and embrace this a little more. But also in you know, last year. About 18 months ago, uh, we had done a survey of 15,000 HR professionals uh, and we covered, it was really focused on their use of robotics and AI. And there was one question in there which really hit a chord. Uh, and the question was, do you believe that increased use of technology undermines the human touch with HR? Okay. And what came out is... Um, more than 50 percent so they so the, actually 10 percent strongly uh, agree that it undermines the human touch uh, about 25 percent uh, said that it somewhat undermines the human touch and another 25 percent said oh it makes no difference so basically i think what came out very strongly is there's still a lot of either uh, hesitation or there is a lack of knowledge, or there's a fear that HR professionals have about AI and technology. And I think a lot of them kind of still either don't understand it, or they feel it's going to either inhibit them or take away the value of what they're doing. Uh, and that was 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 very revealing, because I think in effect, if you look at it, what it shows is the digitization mindset. Um, and, and what probably came through that, and not just that, but in this, you know, I, I meet lots of HR teams. And just yesterday, I was in another discussion with a group of um, actually recruitment professionals. Um, and, and very often, I think there is the feeling that, uh, oh, we are not a technology company. Oh, you know, we are still struggling with some of the basics. So digital is not for us. Or it is that, oh, as and when it becomes necessary, we'll respond to it. Uh, or the third thing that comes up is, but there's just no time. We have so many other things we need to do. So I think uh, the, the, the mindset, therefore, often can be uh, a big barrier, uh, as opposed to saying that, this could be a great opportunity to improve the employee experience, to reduce costs, and I guess help me as, as a professional do f more of the strategic value-added things that I've always wanted to do. Um, so what I felt is I think people need a safe space. Uh, it's too too much for a lot of them to, to actively go and find out or buy a, a solution because you know, whether it's the financial commitment, but also the risk. I mean, you know, buying something, bringing it in-house, not knowing what the impact is. And particularly, I think, with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica now, the issue of ethics are getting far more known. So there is concern about, oh, you're playing with employee data. You know, how? what if there's a, 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 an issue or an error and how will that reflect on us? So the Innovation Hub is really a safe way for people to actually use uh, an AI-based HR solution, but there is no commitment to buy it. And so what? it's a six-month program. And what we do is we figure out, you know, what's what are some of the actual issues? It could be improving the recruit, recruitment process. It could be upskilling your employees about digital. Um, it could be uh, wanting to give coaching to a lot more employees. Um, it or it could be just just you know there's there's lots of different things I think people have but we we try and focus on some an issue that's real and that the team is really wanting to make progress on. We then find the right solution for them, a uh, startup solution. And when I say startups, again we need to understand that it's not as if it's a two person team and the product is just being developed. Today's startup means. You have the solution, they've worked with clients, but they're not huge, big, you know, organizations. 
and we source the right startup, we match it, we uh, usually negotiate a, a free pilot, and then we facilitate a monthly learning session with the HR teams. And the, the learning session could be focused around how the pilot is going, but it could also be around areas like what actually is machine learning. So we could get an expert in to talk about it. Or, oh, we've heard of blockchain. What does that mean? And so we could get an expert on blockchain to talk about them. So it's, it's, it's as I said, a, 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 a great way for HR teams to dip their toe in the water, to start getting familiar with the impact of digital, um, and to see whether these solutions are really uh, useful, are they really that different, um, and to make them more confident then about whatever they want to do. And if at the end of six months they feel this was great, but not for us, that's fine. Uh, but usually our experience is that I think the, the buy-in and the, the learning that happens within the team is, is, is a great incentive for them to start doing more. Yeah, that makes sense. It sounds like you're doing a huge amount to help HR teams. I think it's, you know, I, I'm a huge advocate for the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm someone who thinks that the quicker HR teams, payroll teams, and recruitment teams start to embrace technology, the better. We can't stop it from hitting the market. Um, and I think to, as you say, you know, be head down or, or bury your head in the sand in relation to technology that's that's coming into market is is not a good thing. I think if you the quicker you embrace it, the quicker we'll be ready for change. And actually, from a, a selfish point of view, if you are an individual that embraces it quicker, then you're going to be more equipped to promote your own career later because you'll have that knowledge quicker um, than, than some of your peers do. So I think um, what you're doing is, is fantastic, Deviance. Thank you so much for sharing your information. And of course, I will um, add the links to where people can find out more, but I'll quickly mention it again here. If those that are listening to this podcast are interested in finding out a lot more about Deviani's work, then you can go to hrtechpartnership.com com and i will put the links in the episode notes as well right we're nearly at an end we're just going to quickly open the l and d vault opening the l and d vault in hindsight diani what's one thing you know now that you wish you had known when you began your hr career um i wish i had known that the pace with which i adapt to change and i'm i'm enthusiastic about it is very different from a lot of people and i think it would have if i'd known that earlier it would have made me more realistic about how to drive change and transformation in organizations perfect what's the one common myth and actually for me i'm really interested in this one so what's the one common myth you often hear in the workplace in relation to hr technology and can you debunk it um we don't have the time for it where where is actually it's really going to help you save time and free up time fantastic it's what actually yes fantastic answer and um what I probably thought that was going to come back, and it makes so much sense. We always say we haven't got time, and yet most of the technology being innovated is about saving time. It's a, it's an interesting contradiction. And last but not least, what is the one piece of advice you would give to someone who is embarking on a career in HR? Uh, don't get caught up in HR processes. Try and understand what the business problem is and focus on helping the business with that issue. I think we get drowned in HR processes and forget our role is really to support the business and improve, help the business, improve the business rather than roll out processes. Fantastic. Well, listen, Deviane, it's been an absolute pleasure having on the HR L&D podcast today. I think you've given the listeners a wealth of knowledge to take away. Uh, if someone who's listening to this podcast right now wanted to connect with yourself online, Deviane, is there a link or is there a social uh, page where, they get, where we can direct them to? Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm you know, uh, available on LinkedIn. Uh, me, uh, the HR Tech Partnership is is also there on LinkedIn. You could you could get in touch uh, via that. My email address is hrtechpartnership at gmail.com or else the website has a lot of contact information. So all those routes are available. Fantastic. I'm just going to say that website once more for those that have a pen and paper handy and want to write it down. It's hrtechpartnership.com. And if you do forward slash innovate, you can find a little bit more about some of the innovative solutions they're doing as well. But definitely worth checking out that website. There's a wealth of information. It gives you a lot more insight into some of the uh, the exciting human capital digital work that uh, Deviani is involved in. So please do check it out. This is Lisa. A huge thank you for joining me uh, today, Deviani. Of course, if you are an HR or learning and development professional, 
you're listening to this podcast right now and you have an HR, HRIS or L&D related vacancy that you would love some specialist human resources recruitment support with, please do get in touch with me. I would love to be able to help um, and I would love to show you what a great HR recruitment experience can feel like as well. So reach out to me directly at nick at jgarecruitment.com or of course give the team a call on 01727 800 377. Well, thanks for listening, folks. I look forward to bringing you all the next episode of the HLND podcast real soon. Thank you ever so much for, for your amazing content today, Daviani. Thanks, Nick. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for tuning into HR L&D Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA HR Recruitment. If you need help with a current HR, payroll or L&D vacancy, then please get in touch with Nick and his team. All contact details can be found in the episode notes. In the meantime, to make sure you never miss a future episode, please subscribe to the show through any of your favorite podcast channels. Till next time.